Before I begin this paragraph, I just want to start off by saying that this isn't your average everyday creepypasta that you would find on this wikia. While it does cover lost media, it doesn't have the average cliches that would play normal lost episode creepypastas, there's no satanic shit, no hyper-realistic eyes or blood, or any of that bullshit that creepypastas are known to have. This is actually a real thing that happened to me in real life, and I want to open up about it since it's been eating at my mind for nearly three years. Now, I'm sure that many of you reading this have dreamt of creating your own movies, TV shows, or animations at least once in your lives. I sure as hell did since I'm an aspiring writer, artist, and voice actress, but not all individuals who have dreamt this end up cancelling their own projects due to either writer's block, burnout, or staff being hard to work with, such as John K., who created Ren and Stimpy, or any other abusive hack in the entertainment industry. This article is meant to shed light on a piece of fuck that I had the displeasure of dealing with. The person I'm shedding light on goes by a few handles such as Motley Cat, Models and whatnot. But I'm just going to address him as Cameron, full name being Cameron Murphy, for the sake of simplicity. I met Cameron back in the beginning of 2019, right when I was in the middle of my senior year in high school. I was in a rather terrible headspace, due to some circumstances that I'd rather not get into right now, since they're irrelevant to what this article is about. Essentially, a YouTuber named The Shadow Reader read this littlest pet shop story, which covers an alternate version of one of the shorts on YouTube. We all agreed that the story was good, and I showed interest in doing a reading of said story with voice acting and everything. Cameron saw this and offered to talk with me on Twitter, which I accepted. While we were talking, he nagged me about the reading all throughout February, despite me telling him that I was busy with schoolwork and personal stuff with family. I did shrug it off as him having autism since I have autism myself, which hinders my ability to understand social cues. In March of 2019, I finally did the reading as a way to pay tribute to my friend, since it was five years since she died at that point. Impressions of the characters and everything. When I showed it to him, he stated that the original voice actors sounded better than the characters. I shrugged it off since I was recording while I was sick. Later, he shared some ideas with me about a movie he wanted to make, based on the 2012 adaptation of Littlest Pet Shop's TV series on Discovery Family, which would act as a proper send-off to the series. For those who don't know what the 2012 adaptation of the Littlest Pet Shop series is about, I'll give you guys a short rundown. It's about a girl named Blythe Baxter, moving into a large city with her goofball father who is a pilot. They live in an apartment building above a pet shop that was in danger of going out of business, but due to Blythe sharing her fashion ideas, they put on a fashion show starring the pets. She also discovers that she can communicate with animals similar to Dr. Doolittle, after hitting her head on the way down the dumbwaiter before it got retconned, and confirmed that Blythe is able to speak to animals because her mother used to. In my opinion, I think it's an alright show, but it didn't age well in certain places however, such as with season 4. One egregious example would be the series finale ending on a major cliffhanger. The series finale is about the grand opening of a street centered around the pet shop Blythe works. Blythe unfortunately got stranded on an island with her dad, while retrieving a celebrity pet that's supposed to make it to the grand opening's premiere. The finale ends with Blythe revealing to her dad that she can talk to animals, to which her father explains that he knew because Blythe's mom also talked to animals before she died. There was even a bit at the end where Blythe asks if she should tell Mrs. Twombly, the owner of Littlest Pet Shop, about her ability, which teased the audience since there wasn't a season 5 or any point in the series where Mrs. Twombly wasn't made aware that Blythe could talk to animals. This ending didn't sit well with Cameron, and motivated him to make a movie based on the series to tie up the loose ends. Seems innocent enough, but that's where you are mistaken. In the first few months of us talking, it did seem innocent, but he did decide the main idea of the movie would be rather dark and out of place for the series, due to the large amount of adult content there would be, especially in the planned sequel of the original movie. Basically, the finale was going to be a trilogy of movies, like those Marvel movies that Disney makes. 
For those that want a synopsis for the entire trilogy, I'll describe it the best I can, though some bits are hard to remember. The first movie starts off similarly to Cameron's LPS pasta, down to Penny Ling suffocating from Pepper's fumes, which puts Penny Ling into a coma and makes Pepper extremely guilt-ridden. Once the two are taken to the vet, Penny Ling is put on life support, to where she eventually dies in this I don't feel so good scene. This strikes Blythe with grief and gives her a PTSD attack over her mother dying, and all the pets are stricken with grief. Not really that much happens in the first movie, since it all took place at the vet's office and is centered around Penny Ling's death. For those who don't know, Penny Ling is the sweet one of the group and is the character nobody could possibly hate. So having Cameron kill off Penny Ling who was a fan favorite was questionable and would upset a lot of fans. But I digress since the second and third movie is where the story unfolds. However, before I mention the final two movies, I want to take a break to mention some behind-the-scenes stuff regarding what LPS content we would make before the first movie, since I had the idea to make a fifth season so we can tie all the loose ends to the show's first four seasons. Cameron came up with the idea to insert My My Little Pony OC in the movie, and have her know the main characters in the second movie. While I was hesitant about the idea due to it sounding like a self-insert cringy fanfic, I compromised by having her be in the fifth season, so that Blythe and my character's relationship would be developed over time. This pony OC in question goes by the name, Scarlet Blaze, a goth girl who is married to Spitfire, has dark powers, and has beef with the main antagonist of LPS named, Fisher Biscuit. Yes, I made a cringy goth OC that I don't use anymore, since I phased myself out of the pony fandom. Cameron had some ideas for things that Scarlet would do in the series. A few of those things involve an ongoing feud between her and Fisher Biscuit, due to the fact that Scarlet beat him into a wheelchair after he sicked his robot on her to have her locked in his pet shop, which warranted Fisher to try suing Littlest Pet Shop. At the end of the episode, the entire court case bit Fisher in the ass, to the point where not only did he lose the court case, but he also lost his business license and his wife Eliza in the process, due to Eliza having enough with his tomfoolery and she took the mansion that her husband owned, while Fisher kept custody of the Biscuit Twins, the two main antagonists of the series. The entire season's storyline is about Fisher finding a way to get back at Scarlet Blaze through cartoony schemes and whatnot. One example is that Fisher dressed up as a mall Santa in the planned Christmas special. Another example is the episode named, Above and Beyond Scared Straight. The plot of the episode was that the Biscuit Twins got arrested for taking bricks or rocks and throwing them at the littlest pet shop windows. However, since the prison is full, the police decide to let the twins off with a warning. This doesn't settle with Scarlet and Blythe with the former wanting revenge. So, the two decide to turn Littlest Pet Shop into a prison, before grabbing the two twins and locking them inside while impersonating police officers, and doing various horrible things to them for the entire weekend. This includes interrogating them and using intimidation tactics, forcing them to eat pet food as their meals, locking them in Blythe's room, having that act as a cell, with Spitfire and Blythe's friend Young Me, who were impersonating unhinged cellmates that go out of their way to physically assault the twins. And one more thing was having Scarlet Blaze put the two twins in a sewer hole that she dubbed, the hole, for trying to escape the first time. The two twins escape a second time by crawling into the sewers a la Shawshank Redemption. The episode ends with Fisher picking up the twins, who were crying about what Scarlet Blaze and Blythe did to them, before revealing that Fisher was behind the two twins act at the beginning of the episode the entire time. It honestly was a horrible episode, and it was the episode that made me call the project quits when I voice acted for the episode, due to how uncomfortable it made me. Before you ask, I was the voice of numerous characters for this reboot, such as Mrs. Twombly, Pepper Clark, Russell, for one episode, and of course Scarlet Blaze. I honestly felt uncomfortable voicing such a character who was such an awful person, to where she was okay with hurting children. There was even a line that Scarlet said in the court episode. Their father better deal with them or I'll deal with them myself. And trust me, I am not above hitting children in front of their parents. Besides, I know my way with words. So I'll talk to their father and maybe he could fix their behavior and make sure it doesn't happen again.
which I voiced and will show to you guys so that you can better understand what Scarlet Blaze's voice was going to sound like in the series. Anyways, Scarlet Blaze beating up the twins and subjecting them to painful slapstick was going to be a running gag throughout season 5. Another example was in the episode, Who's Your Mommy, where the Biscuit Twins make fun of Blythe for not having a mum, which makes Scarlet Blaze, who gave her a ride to school, use her dark powers to levitate to rocks the size of a baseball, and chuck both of them at the back of the twins' heads when they weren't looking, before it cuts back to Scarlet Blaze's smug face. This would be fine dandy and everything, but there is a major issue, aside from the fact that Blythe and her friends are uncharacteristically enabling Scarlet to do this, and that's the fact that the twins were both in junior high school. So, Scarlet Blaze, who is my adult pony OC, is emotionally, psychologically and physically abusing to children. Keep in mind, this is probably not even the worst thing that Scarlet Blaze has done to the two. I will get to that later. Other things that were added in the season would be adult themes, such as death, murder, and sexual themes. A few examples being an episode that features the death of Princess Skystar, a character from the My Little Pony movie. The reason she dies is because she'd be living in the downtown city ocean which would be filled with pollution. The episode was replaced with a wackier story where Princess Skystar is sick, which makes Blythe, Scarlet and the group take Princess Skystar's body to a scientist that Scarlet knows, so that he could shrink them down so they can travel through Princess Skystar's body to destroy the virus that way. You know, like those fantastic voyage plots you'd see in cartoons. The episode ends with Princess Skystar waking up and wreaking havoc on the city, due to the shrunken down submarine hitting her brain. This makes her hijack a car and drive all around the city, resulting in a police chase while the city was being destroyed. The ultimate finish to the episode would be that Scarlet Blaze fights a giant trash monster that was made of all the trash that humans were throwing in the ocean. There was even a moral at the end of the episode that you shouldn't pollute oceans. Of course, this wouldn't sit well with Cameron, who yelled at me about changing the story, and for treating the fifth season like a kid's cartoon, until I went, fine have your stupid story about Sky Star dying. That was the last episode that me and Cameron wrote before parting ways. In fact, I think now would be ample time to discuss Cameron's role in the fifth season, since it does show off some red flags of him being difficult to work with. To add some context regarding the project, me and Cameron were the only two writers on the entire team. And I was tasked to write every single episode. All 20 of them. Some of which were double length and two-parters. I had to do all of it while he worked on the script for that stupid movie trilogy. I think the worst part of that was the deadline for release. The deadline for when everything was going to be released was at the end of 2021 which was coming very around the corner when these screenshots took place. I remembered I kept asking him for help with writing a section of the script that I got stuck on, and he would only write one line before leaving me to do the rest. The real kicker was that when I kept asking him to help me more often, he would snap and tell me that there are things he wants to write rather than things he doesn't want to write, which would cause those episodes to either be put on the back burner or scrapped entirely. All because he wouldn't help someone who he had on his team and someone that he claimed to care for. He even wanted to have the entire thing animated as well, which I obviously couldn't do since I didn't know how to animate at that time, and animation obviously takes time to do so. I could have storyboarded the entire thing, but we didn't even finish the script for the entire trilogy to even start with the storyboarding. However, that isn't the worst red flag he has done in terms of being hard to work with. Back around May of 2021, I had to go to my grandparents' house all the way across the country to take care of them due to both of them having surgery. One of them had a tumor or something. I told Cameron about this exactly a day in advance that I would be driving down and that I wouldn't have access to my phone since I'd be driving across the country to see my grandparents. When I got to their house, I logged into my computer to see that I had multiple DMs from Cameron where he was talking about random stuff. His final DM I saw was, are you ready to resume writing ma'am, which obviously pissed me off. I told him off for not listening to me and I don't particularly remember the response I had in question, but me having to take care of my grandparents, who were recovering from surgery, had to put the project on hold until the middle of June. 
I think I put off talking about the movie trilogy long enough. Now would be the time to go back to talking about it. The second part of the movie begins with Blythe waking up. When her father greeted her, Blythe asked who he was and who she was. Like she had early onset dementia, to which it was revealed that she had early onset dementia at least in this third of the trilogy, which meant that one character was going to take Blythe's place as the main protagonist of the rest of the trilogy. That character being Young Me, who is Blythe's best friend in the original series. Her story is about facing the main antagonist of the rest of the trilogy, since the sequels are actually a two-parter disguised as two movies. The main antagonist's story was about them being a fan of the Biscuit family business and wanting to partner with them for profit. The Biscuit twins accept after Fisher Biscuit dies of cancer. This isn't going to be the last character death in the sequels. Thus the main antagonist named Silas ends up killing multiple animal and human characters in the series. One of those characters being Young Me's Aunt Christy, who is a character that Young Me lives with and is the owner of the sweet shop. When Young Me was grieving, Scarlet Blaze made her appearance showing up after being absent from the first movie, due to her and her wife spent fire being on a vacation. The Pegasus consoles the Korean child and offers Young Me and her friends shelter, which is a secluded cabin in the woods. In the cabin, Scarlet Blaze meets her little sister in the movie, Wilted Rose, who agrees to let Young Me, Sue and Jasper, the latter two are also Blythe's friends in the original show, stay in the cabin. A conversation happens which leads to a reveal that when Wilted Rose was transported into the human world, she had a few human friends that passed on. In another draft, Wilted also worked for Fisher Biscuit, who malnourished her and treated her like a pet slave after taking her in when her human friends died. The movie then has a climax where Wilted betrays the group, which results in a clash between her and Scarlet which ends with Scarlet coming off on top. Scarlet, Spitfire, Jasper, Young Me and Sue confront the main baddie of the film, who reveals that Wilted was working for them. This results in a clash between the two groups, which ends in Wilted Rose biting the necks of both Scarlet and Spitfire, which corrupts them into killing the three teenagers. I haven't mentioned it yet, but the subplot of Part 2 and Part 3 would be that Pepper would have to overcome her guilt for accidentally killing Penny Ling. Not much happens, but quite a bit does happen with Part 3 however. Very dumb plot and very out of place for a littlest pet shop movie, I know. But you haven't seen anything yet when talking about the final movie of the trilogy. The third movie starts right where the second movie left off as to be expected, since it's a two-parter. Funny enough, Rainbow Dash, who was in the LPS universe with Twilight and a few other members of the main six, saw the entire thing and decided to fly around the Earth as fast as she could to reverse the flow of time, like in Swag.mov, to get to where the fight started. Now, why Rainbow Dash couldn't do that to reverse the events of the entire movie, I hear you asking. Well, I don't know. What exactly was stopping her from doing that? It was very evident that Cameron was the one who wrote the entire story, and that I didn't have as much creative input if not any creative input at all. So, after the events of the movie were reversed to where the fight happened right as Scarlet and Spitfire got corrupted, instead of trying to fight, Young Me and the rest of her friends ran away. Instead of there being one subplot in the third movie, there are two subplots. One of those subplots being the aforementioned Pepper subplot, which there isn't much to talk about regarding it, since most of it contains talking and a few nightmare sequences. One of those nightmare sequences involved a painting that Minka made of Blythe and the pets coming to life and blaming Pepper for Penny Ling's death. Basically, Cameron got inspiration from my paint a picture it'll last longer creepypasta I made all the way back in 2020. The second subplot involved Spike, Starlight Glimmer, Trixie and Thorax trying to stop the past antagonists of the My Little Pony series along with the antagonist of the movie. There isn't much to say about the subplots, due to the fact that it feels like padded out filler despite everything being 120 pages in the script last I checked. I also remembered that the subplot with Pepper ended with Russell Ferguson, a smart nerdy hedgehog character, chasing Pepper into the woods in a fit of anger before dying of old age. Now, regarding the main plot, there really isn't much to discuss aside from Scarlet Blaze and Spitfire serving the Biscuit Twins. 
Cameron suggested to me on Discord that the two Pegasi would act lustful towards the twins, which made me uncomfortable and I don't even need to explain why. The movie would also introduce Scarlet Blaze's adopted mum. I don't remember much about her, but I remember Cameron cast Rachel Bloom to play her. Besides, there isn't much to talk about with the main plot of the movie involving Scarlet and Spitfire, aside from the fact that there were heavy amounts of torture scenes involving not only the human characters, most of which are children, but of the pet characters too. Said torture scenes were reminiscent of the Saw movies due to how graphic and detailed it is. One of those torture scenes involved Blythe as well, which made me uncomfortable to read since she's a kid. Now, due to the fact that Cameron and I fell out before the script was even finished, the entire trilogy got cancelled. However, due to Cameron showing me a lot of his work and telling me his ideas for the films, I know how the movie is supposed to end. I'm going to offer a recap of what I remember. The movie has a climax where there is an Avengers Endgame style fight scene against the people who support Littlest Pet Shop versus the people who support Largest Ever Pet Shop, the competing pet shop in the original series. Said climax had a bunch of bloodshed and carnage. There was even a moment where Princess Cadence and Shining Armor got killed in front of Flurry Heart, who is their baby. Scarlet Blaze and Spitfire get cured of their corruption during the fight too, which caused the downfall of largest ever pet shop. The slasher villain guy got killed off along with Wilted Rose. When Wilted died, she did have a redemption by sacrificing herself to protect Scarlet. After the battle was done, the Biscuit Twins were lying on the pavement after being mortally wounded in the fight. To rub salt in the wound, Scarlet would yell at them, giving them a piece of her mind after putting her and the individuals she cares about through so much hell. She tells them to leave downtown city and never return, considering they would be hated by the entire city. The twins tearfully apologize and state that they'll change for the better. When Scarlet Blaze and Young Me leave, Brittany, who is the dumber of the two twins, attempts to fire a crossbow at Young Me, but it is swiftly caught by an angered Scarlet who goes over to the two twins and proceeds to punch both of them with enough force to where it breaks their ribcage, killing both of them. Yes, Scarlet Blaze actually planned to murder two children at the end of the movie, and yes, she was meant to be likable. Afterwards, Scarlet Blaze, Young Me, Spitfire and Pepper go to Penny Ling's grave. Since Scarlet Blaze is able to bring people back to life, but the only issue is that there needs to be a sacrifice in order for Penny Ling to be brought back to life. Pepper volunteers to be sacrificed as Scarlet performs the ritual, which brings Penny Ling back to life, but Pepper is killed in the process. Penny Ling greets everyone until she sees Pepper's corpse. Rather than bawling her eyes out as she would be expected to do, she does tear up but thanks Pepper for all she has done. The entire group hosts a funeral for everyone who has fallen in, the great war that would get us sued by Marvel, Hasbro and many other properties. The remaining pets that were alive at the end meet a character that was supposed to be Pepper's sister named Salt. Real creative, I know. After the funeral, Young Me makes her way back to the sweet shop, packing her stuff since she plans to move back to Korea with her parents, due to the fact that her Aunt Christie is dead. However, Scarlet decides to adopt Young Me as her kid. The final scene of the movie would involve Mrs. Twombly retiring as the owner of Littlest Pet Shop and handing over the reins to Scarlet Blaze, due to her being the reason for Littlest Pet Shop's success, because that Blythe, am I right? Which was why Scarlet was targeted in the movies. Now that I'm finished with summarizing the movies, I'll share my thoughts on the entire trilogy. There is so much wrong with the entire trilogy. Especially the last two movies. So much wrong that if I were to write them all down, this article would be another seven pages longer. One thing that is obviously wrong would be how unnecessarily dark the entire plot is and how out of place it would be for a kid's show. Even the fifth season's episodes didn't go that far in terms of how dark it was. And that was filled with its own problems such as characters cussing out of the blue and in every other sentence. If you know the meme, Blank Show if it was written by Vizzy Pop, then you'll know precisely what I'm talking about. I even addressed to Cameron that everything to be toned down, due to the fact that I wasn't comfortable writing the characters to be in gruesome situations due to them being from a kid's show. That of course led to Cameron having a breakdown when I criticized him. 
There were other things that he inserted into the show, such as his gross and absurd fetishes. For context, he has these weird vomiting inflation and underwater fetishes that he insert in his projects at almost every opportunity he is given. I shrugged them off as I thought they were things he found to be funny when I first interacted with him. There were a few instances where he tried getting me to draw his fetishes annoyingly. One of the things he did get me to draw was a sketch of Vinny, who is a gecko, feeling nauseous as he stated me was curious if when Vinny was nauseous, he'd turn a darker shade of green or not. I have the picture in case anyone wants to see what I'm referring to. I think that now would be a great time to talk about the fallout I had with Cameron and the consequences that I put in place for his actions regarding the project. Back around July or August of 2021, Cameron invited me to a Littlest Pet Shop 2012 server. When I got in, I saw messages of him and the other members discussing the fan-made fifth season he and I were working on, along with the movies that he was intending to have been the show's proper finale in vivid detail. He even proceeded to say stuff like, I wouldn't had to take matters into my own hands if Hasbro treated the show better, along with various other insults directed at Hasbro for ending the series with loose ends. To make matters worse, he started talking about the torture scenes that will be in the final part of the series. Keep in mind, most of the server members were minors and it made everyone uncomfortable. Thus, the mobs DM'd him to tone things down. When he refused to cooperate, the mobs DM'd me to give me an update on what Cameron was doing. I just woke up at the time and I already had a headache, so this didn't help matters. I tried to de-escalate the situation as best as I could, but Cameron ended up leaving the server which made me exceptionally angry, since the mobs who actually offered to help us, stated they weren't comfortable helping us with the project anymore. This led me to yell at him for doing what he did, and he decided to take a break for a week. This gave me plenty of time to check on some of his things regarding the stuff he would post on his socials. I wish that I hadn't done that however, since I wound up finding some creepy and disgusting things that were on his favorites when looking through his deviant art. Some of which was art of Blythe and Sue, who again are two minors, in the water, which I will remind you once again, Cameron had a weird underwater fetish. So, the fact that he was fetishizing two characters who are minors is sickening. But things get even worse. On the night of our fallout, I was looking through Cameron's socials, until I found out that he had a fur affinity linked from his YouTube channel. Once I clicked on the link, I was immediately greeted with his fetish porn, but one picture stood out to me. That one being a picture that Cameron took of his stomach while he was in nothing but his underwear. I went to check on the date of the picture, only to find that this was posted when he was 16 years old. Yes, he lives in the UK, where the age of consent is 18. However, it's still the distribution of child pornography according to federal law. When I saw this, I immediately set up a voice chat with him so that I could confront him, since I didn't feel mentally well enough to text all my questions to him and I wanted to have recorded evidence of him admitting to it, to which I have the audio file of his confession right here. Okay, um, another question that I want to ask you, um, um, you, you do know that, um, you, I, I, I saw your, I saw what you posted on Furfinity. You posted a picture of your stomach. You, you were, you were nothing more but briefs. And you, and you posted this when you were 16. What, why? Why did you do that? Hmm? Said I did it already better at the time. Okay, well, you do realize that, um, uh, you, you may want to delete that off of your Furfinity because, you know, um, that, that's, that's not okay. That, that, that's not okay to post pictures like that of yourself. Has anyone taught you that, have any, have, have your parents taught you 
about that, like about things that you can and cannot post on the internet. After all of that, I yelled at him to fuck off and never contact me again, before telling him that I'm taking over his project. Of course, this goes as well as anyone would expect it to, with him bursting into tears and yelling at me about how I'm being mean to him as a way to guilt me into feeling sorry for him. However, he didn't block me yet. He actually decided to confront me about our call in DMs by stating that I've been shitty to him, trying to put words in my mouth, accusing me of snooping on his socials to spite him, yes, his public socials that are linked to his platform, and he called me a cunt in the process. I had enough of this and unfriended him and blocked his account, along with most of the communication I had with him at the time. The last message he sent me on Twitter was some dumb comment about this user misanthropony or some nonsense. The aftermath of Cameron's ousting wasn't expected, because I found out that there were more victims of his than I realized. Because once I kicked him off the project and took over, I did research on him only to find out that some YouTuber called him a pedophile. This user in question posted a video that highlighted screenshots, such as Cameron threatening to murder a minor and have their corpse raped in a Discord server which led to him getting banned. Cameron made a video discussing what he has done, which he admits to making an autistic girl who was suicidal self-harm in a live stream, vandalizing a person's script for their series, along with other things. Things got so bad to the point where he deleted his Twitter, his YouTube channel and other socials, and is only active on DeviantArt until he decided to fuck off from the internet permanently. Don't get me wrong, he occasionally posts on there, but not as frequently since he knows that he's guilty and that nobody is willing to forgive him enough to have him work on their projects anymore. Now, what exactly did I end up doing after picking him off the project and out of my life? Well, I ended up needing to fix the scripts and remove all the cussing, sexual jokes, and dark elements. Of course from the voice clip I posted, I did forget to remove a couple of dark elements. I even started over certain scripts from scratch, such as the Princess Sky Star episode, but I didn't have enough time on my hands to fix the other scripts, which was why I cancelled the reboot in late 2022 to early 2023, due to me deciding it was time for me to phase myself out of the MLP community to avoid more toxic people like Cameron. In fact, in early 2022, Cameron sent me an email detailing an apology for how he acted, which wasn't solicited. I immediately blocked the email after taking a screenshot which I will show right now. I think since we are in the process of wrapping up the story, I want to answer a few questions. Did I know that Cameron was doing any of this stuff with kids? No, I had no idea, due to how good he was at hiding his behavior, and due to the fact that I wasn't in the servers where most of his behavior took place. Did I know about him posting CP on Fur Affinity? Again, no. Mainly due to the fact that I learned about him having a fur affinity account the exact night I and Cameron fell out, and since I don't have a fur affinity myself. What about the stuff he favorited on DeviantArt? I haven't visited his DeviantArt profile that much, if not at all enough to look into his favorites mainly, due to me not visiting DeviantArt very often. How far in development did you get before falling out with Cameron versus the aftermath? Before me and Cameron fell out, we got as far as to make episode 9, but as far as I came to writing after the fallout, I got to writing the script for two more episodes and got to storyboarding the first episode and voice acting, before my plug-in hard drive ended up shorting out. I did however end up redoing the first episode's voice acting on my end, along with the rest of the first four episodes. How involved were you in writing the stories for each episode? I was involved with writing a bit of the dialogue and writing many summaries of every episode that I pitched to Cameron however, Cameron had creative control over most of the stories in each episode. Why did it take you until the end of 2022 to scrap the entire thing? Mainly due to me not wanting my two years of hard work to go down the drain. I was pretty damn stubborn, but I regret not quitting sooner, due to the project being detrimental to my mental health. Do you plan on releasing any complete scripts for any of the episodes or the movies? Absolutely not. Mainly due to the fact that I refuse to have my name attached to this bullshit any longer. I do have the script for every episode, and the people I did send it to are trusted to not leak them. 
If it wasn't obvious enough, I'm absolutely ashamed for having something to do with these scripts, and if I could go back in time, I wouldn't have made them at all. There are a few scripts and fan fictions of the movie Cameron pitched that he uploaded on the internet, but I'm not linking any of them here since I want you to never view them. To be real, if you guys want to do remakes or creepypasta retakes of this, which I doubt anyone would want to do, I don't care as long as you take my characters out of the remake. Don't ask me to voice act or animate for it either, due to the project itself making me uncomfortable. Can I read your article centered around them on my YouTube channel? I don't care as long as you spread the word about this guy. In conclusion, I dodged a bullet scrapping this project and picking that creepy fuck off my team. I feel the moral of this story would be that if you plan on creating something this big, you have to start small first, or else you will be setting yourself up for failure. Besides, there is no way that either of us would make a project like this and have it out in theaters. Realistically, we'd probably have it out on YouTube, which could possibly get me and Cameron in massive trouble with Hasbro for distributing their IPs and making an animated series that includes violence, gore, profanity, and all that shit. What if a little kid were to stumble across the fifth season and think it's real? Not only would Cameron be destroying that kid's childhood, but that would be a reason for him to get sued by Hasbro. I mean, look at Super Mario Logan. He did the same stuff with Nintendo's characters to the point where he got a cease and desist, and was forced to switch to the human puppets permanently. So in order to play it safe, it would be advised to create an original series instead of making a series rebooting a pre-existing property that would most likely be protected by copyright law. Like me for example, I'm still planning on making my own indie animation show however, I want to start off small to avoid a repeat of what happened last time.